Welcome back. Another fascinating aspect of this, at least to me, Kim, is the asymmetry in the kind of weaponry that the U.S. is using versus these attacks on U.S. forces and commercial vessels. There's a story in Politico that describes this from December, and it says that in a single day, the USS Kearney destroyer intercepted 14 attack drones, and those drones are estimated to cost $2,000 or so a piece. And in contrast, these very sophisticated missiles that the Navy uses to intercept aerial threats can cost up to $2 million a shot. And that is an interesting aspect of this, because while it is great that the U.S. is able to have that kind of aerial shield over friendly forces, it has raised the question in recent days whether the White House, whether President Biden needs to take that fight to those launch sites and so forth, which he has now done, because how long can the Navy, the U.S. forces sit there and shoot $2 million missiles at $2,000 drones? And you have to remember that this comes at a time that we are having a national discussion about the amount of equipment and missiles and other necessary war equipment that we have sent over to Ukraine, efforts that we are making to help Israel. There are a lot of hotspots right now, and they are sucking up a lot of our inventory. One of the discussions that is going on in Congress at the moment about this Ukraine funding, which is still on hold, and Israel funding, some of that money is supposed to be earmarked to, in fact, replace and replenish our own stocks, some of which are becoming very concerningly low. And this is now only growing as we have this modern technology that allows these rebel forces and militias to wage a very unequal attack on us, as it were. So at minimal cost to them, and let's be clear, even sort of minimal training, they can harry our forces right and left and commercial interests in the Red Sea. And as you say, the best way for us to make sure that those attacks aren't successful is to utilize this extremely expensive equipment. And that's good that we have that capacity, but it isn't something that can continue forever. And that has been a criticism that's really been growing of the administration, which is it's been clear to a number of people for some time, including our military experts, that the best way to shut down their ability to launch all of these drones in particular is to target the places where they sit and where they operate from. And the fact that we're only doing it now, I think, again, just shows how overdue this action is. With any luck, our military planners have a far more extensive list of where to go and try to take that stuff out, because that's going to be vital if we are actually going to damage in some way or degrade the Houthis' ability to keep this up. Another piece of this strike that is worth noting, I think, Bill, is that the U.S. was not acting alone. There were also military forces for the United Kingdom, one of America's closest allies that took part in the strikes. And then there was also support from Australia, Bahrain, Canada, and the Netherlands. David Cameron, the former prime minister and now foreign secretary of the UK, is saying this, the safety of UK vessels and the freedom of navigation across the Red Sea is paramount. And that is why we are taking action. And Bill, it's good to see other allies, American allies, step up to help with this fight. Frankly, I don't know why it should be more. The coalition should be greater. Again, according to the statement from President Biden, there have been more than 50 nations affected by these attacks on commercial ships, including crews from more than 20 countries. And at some point, Bill, this is not an attack on another nation state. This is a defense of shipping against what is essentially piracy, pirates that are on the high seas threatening commercial vessels that are not doing anything wrong, that are transiting international waters. Frankly, I think this coalition should be bigger pushing back against that kind of lawlessness. Yeah, of course it is. But that's a history. So many times when there's something that needs to be done, the United States and basically the axis with Australia, Britain, and maybe Japan, they're the core of the good guys that always sign up for these things. Part of the reason is the other people are uncertain. America calls for them to help and then kind of negotiate separately, and they don't know whether they'll be left holding the bag. And I think, uh, you know, you look at Ukraine, 
Joe Biden, I think, I believe, I've never heard him call for the Ukrainians to win. So what are you actually trying to do? Just prolong the war indefinitely? He says Putin can't win, but he's never said, to my knowledge, the Ukrainians have to win. And worse than that, he's never gone to the public and explained his Ukrainian policy, which I think there's a lot of justification for, and laid out its case, I think there'd be strong public support for. I think he doesn't do it because I think he knows that the support in his own party is very thin and will go south when things go south. So I think you always have to be willing to go it by yourself. I share your view, of course. All these um, countries are affected. But of course, you have the constant free rider problem. If the U.S. is going to fix it without them, why take the risk? We have to support our allies, show our appreciation for their support, and set a goal that we can reach that people understand and achieve it. And I think they will, no matter how small the coalition is, because kind of implicit in what you're saying, the Red Sea is vital for trade and everything. The added costs of going around Africa are enormous, both in time and money for shippers, for example. And of course, what a bad precedent would set, for example, for China in the Pacific to start causing mischief. Kim, another argument that is circulating today is that President Biden was supposed to go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war before taking this step. Here is the argument from Ro Khanna on Twitter or the website formerly known as Twitter. The president needs to come to Congress before launching a strike against the Houthis in Yemen and involving us in another Middle East conflict. That is Article 1 of the Constitution. I will stand up for that, regardless of whether a Democrat or Republican is in the White House, unquote. And Kim, I wonder what you make of that argument. Well, you get these complaints every single time a president takes unilateral action, some sort of strike out there. Sometimes it's Republicans lodging them. Sometimes it's Democrats. Sometimes it's a bipartisan coalition, although usually a minority. I mean, look, we understand that the president does have a pretty sweeping mandate to protect American interests and that engaging in strikes are very different than a declaration of war, which is something that is less controversial about the president needing to go to Congress if there's going to be some intimation of a a long and prolonged American military action. Where those lines fall have always been complicated, thus the debate. But look, we've had many presidents over time that have launched strikes. I mean, even more recently, President Biden has launched some retaliatory strikes against Iranian-backed militias that have gone after our bases in the Middle East. Does this one sort of rise to a higher level? It's hard for me to see how that could possibly be. This seems instead to be a drumbeat from those who would rather that we tuck tail and don't engage, attempting to put pressure on the White House not to go any further. I think it's unfortunate because, as mentioned, this action, if anything, comes too late. Hang tight. We'll be right back after one more break. Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Bill, the other question I wanted to raise is a topic that we touched in a previous podcast, and that is the hospitalization of Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. And there is some reporting now that he has been involved with the planning of this strike and was intimately involved with it and even monitored it in real time, though I believe I could be wrong that he is still in the hospital there at Walter Reed. Does this add anything, I think, to the debates over the controversy of his hospitalization and the delay in anyone at the Defense Department telling the White House that the defense secretary had entered intensive care unit. I would regard the news that he was intimately involved as positive. The man is the defense secretary. He's back on his feet and he's involved in doing what should be his job. So that would be good news. I think the problem that we had was only half 
that he didn't report that he was missing or out of action. The bigger half to me seems to be the embarrassing news that no one noticed, which suggests that he's not that closely involved with the White House and things. Um, And I think now they're trying to correct that impression. But that's a more troubling thing to me, that he was out of the loop and no one seemed to notice or care. Kim, I take Bill's point here that it's good news that the Secretary of Defense is apparently working and able to have that communication and that direct involvement. Here is the line in the Politico article on this that was published this afternoon. It says that Lloyd Austin authorized the final decision for U.S. forces to move forward with the attack on more than 60 Houthi targets and monitored the operation in real time, according to two senior administration officials. Again, it does make me wonder, this is probably not the kind of operation that comes together in a matter of hours at the Defense Department. Presumably, there was some planning going on, and I wonder if it was going on in that period last week where Lloyd Austin was in the hospital and nobody in the White House had been informed of that. Oh, absolutely. Not just the planning, but I think all this does is highlight how concerning that absence and lack of information was last week, that apparently we did this in response to a more coordinated attack that the Houthis had done, their largest to date, as I noted in the beginning. But is that really the case? Has this been in the works for a while? Look, I think it's great that Lloyd Austin is doing better, that he's recovering. He is still in a hospital. I think the question of coordination and also his physical presence there is, does Walter Reed have the facilities necessary to have classified confidential, you know, discussions going on. There are doctors, anyone who's been in a hospital knows that they're pretty busy places with a lot of folks running around. I don't think that that's necessarily ideal either, all of which just highlights the problem here and how much better it would have been for the Defense Department and Pentagon to have been upfront about the Defense Secretary's incapacity for that period of time. Bill, we'll give you the last word, but do you suppose that this will have the deterrent effect that President Biden hopes? His statement, again, says that it's a clear message that the United States and our partners will not tolerate attacks on our personnel or allow hostile actors to imperil freedom of navigation. And I guess to the argument that we've been making, better late than ever, though, it does seem that tolerating those attacks and those imperiling of the freedom of the seas is what the United States has spent weeks and weeks doing. Yes, they have. The answer to your question is, I hope so. I hope that what was done is enough. But the answer to that is not up to me or you or even the Biden White House. It's up to the Houthis. And we're going to find out whether it was enough by whether attacks cease or whether they pause for a while and they get back to doing what they were doing. And I'm not hopeful in that regard. Thank you, Bill and Kim. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Potomac Watch.